the Fish Lake area in British Columbia mounted a successful legal challenge against the Seagull Mining Project. I'm just curious to know if there has been a similar challenge mounted or attempted in Alberta by the First Nations, and if not, then why not? I think, I think David might be more interested, uh, yeah, uh, well versed in what happened at Fish Lake. Um, I heard about it. But yes, there are legal challenges ongoing. And you saw one fellow in the film, Jack Woodward, he's a lawyer in Victoria, and he's representing the Beaver Lake Cree, which are in the southern part of the oil sands. Uh, and that's a, a, a constitutional challenge. The challenge is that the Beaver Lake Cree no longer have, can exercise the right to fish, hunt, and trap as was given to them in their treaty because of the extent of development. Thing is, it takes millions of dollars of uh, scientific work to substantiate the claim that you can't exercise these rights. So this is expected to be a, about a 10 year process and I, I know that they're still trying to raise money. So they're, they're, there are legal challenges, but they're grinding through the system very slowly. Well, Enbridge is a company that wants to uh, build a pipeline to take the oil from the tar sands to the west coast of British Columbia. And that pipeline will exit at uh, Kitimat on the, on the uh, west coast. And the idea is then the oil would not only be shippable down to the states for refining or, or right across to China. And the uh, every coastal First Nation has is in opposition to it. And most of the interior natives through whose territory that pipeline will pass are, uh, are against it. So that will definitely be a, a huge First Nations battle if, if Enbridge uh, persists in that. Um, I noticed in the film there are a couple of like conflicting messages um, in the sense that they said if we abandon the tar sands then there will be a huge economic impact on Canada, seeing as um, the tar sands are hugely responsible for Canada's economic success. Whereas, if we keep going with the tar sands, obviously, this the film is about, we'll suffer um, great economic, I mean, sorry, not economic, uh, environmental disaster. What do you think is the best solution um, we can use to kind of minimize economic uh, damage while still abandoning the tar sands and keeping um, our environment um, sustained? Well, yeah, we're trapped. <laughs> you put your finger on it. it it's, it's a big question. And, um, you know, I think the Suzuki Foundation does a lot of work to try to answer it. What I would say is that we don't even understand what those uh, mines and upgraders cost us. We don't cost the activity correctly. Human health, damage to the environment, the cost that your generation is going to have to pay to clean up those ponds in the future, it's not costed into the cost of that oil. They're called externalities. And so what we have to do is begin to recost in a more holistic way what it takes to do this. And once we have the real cost, then we can soberly answer the question, should we be doing this? Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trapped, we're junkies, and, and, and when junkies get off crack, it's a really painful process. Um, and uh, and I, I think you'd be naive to say that we're going to shut down the oil sands tomorrow. It's just a very heavy train running down the tracks. I, I have a, a two-part answer to that. Uh, one is that uh, as long as the economy becomes our highest priority, and everything else is second to that, then we're really hooped. You see, uh, the economy is based on, or at least the current economy is based on the idea that we need steady growth. And uh, growth ju just is, and we're becoming overly dependent, especially in Alberta, on growth in the energy sector. So I think there, there are two points. One, one is, is that when you become heavily dependent on a single industry, you become very, very vulnerable. Andrew Nikifor, one of the leading speakers in there, says, when you look at the history of petroleum in states around the world, you become, when you become a petrol state, whether it's Nigeria or, or, uh, or Venezuela or, or, uh, uh, or Texas, you become a petrol dictatorship. That is, the oil industry then begins to, to run the country and all of the other uh, de democratic rights disappear. And I think he makes a very compelling case for this. 
So that's, I think, what we're seeing in spades right now in Alberta, where the Minister of the Environment becomes an apologist for the oil industry. The other thing, though, is that as long as economics is a higher priority than the very air that we depend on, the water we, we live on, or biodiversity, the other creatures, we're going to be hooped. What we always do is we ask nature to pay the price, to be shoehorned into our priorities. And I, where you see the problem with that in spades was in Copenhagen last, uh, last year. In Copenhagen, you had 192 countries looking at the world through their own 192 national boundaries. Air doesn't give a shit about national boundaries. Air just goes all over the world. Not the same with water. But we're looking at it through our national borders and then our economic priorities. And we're trying to make nature fit our national uh, economic agendas. And it's not going to work.